Today, we're gonna to talk about concrete pavement construction. I'll talk a little bit about the history, and then we'll go into what's actually going on whenever you pour a concrete pavement. So a lot of these pictures are not mine. I don't own the copyrights to them, but they're really cool pictures. Uh, just, just really cool. It really gives you a lot of great detail and understanding uh, about where we have been and you know where we're going. So let's talk about early excavation. You know, 120 years ago, this was high tech technology. We had a two horsepower uh, equipment. You could see here. That's my dad joke of the day. And you can see a steam powered excavator over there. These are actually buggies. So two horsepower dump truck. And they would excavate dirt to get the, 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 the pavement nice and level. Um, here's another picture of, of a Mack Bulldog and, and steam shovel. It's, you know, it looks pretty cool. Uh, you know, they're just digging to make a road. Here's a steam powered street paver, which really you have your mixer here and you have a, I believe this is a, a chute series of, you know, maybe over there, you dump it in, in there. And, and so there's a really a series of, of chutes and stuff. So this is, I wouldn't call it that really a paver. This is a little bit closer to what you think of as a paver today, but it's still not exactly there. It's more of like a, a ready mix truck um, but this is kind of another chain belt, uh, steam, steam paver. And so people are getting from just using a wheelbarrow with rock and sand and cement and water, mixing it all up and then putting it on the, on the ground. They're doing, you know, they're using a, a mixer, a mixer, uh, truck type operation. So this is really like high tech ready mix operation, uh, you know, from back then. So 1922 in Youngston, Ohio, this is, you can see the chute there and they're putting the material, you know, they dump all the material in there and it'll go into the mixer. It mixes up and then they discharge it obviously into the ground. This is like a 19, uh, uh, 50s, I believe, early 50s. This is kind of what, you know, where we went, you can see here, there is, this is fixed forms on the side and there is a paving machines that are coming together where they're actually starting to place and consolidate a lot of that concrete. So you have a, a paver here and probably if I was a guessing person, this would be like a second paver there. That could be a curing cart, but because of that, the top of that surface, it doesn't look very pretty. I bet you that it's just another slip form paver that's, that's trying to get the, the concrete down even better. So here's kind of, you know, um, you can see here, this is where one of the, the websites, I think I got this U, uh, off a uh, YouTube video, a screenshot, some of these pictures, but um, there's a lot of really cool um, pictures that you can find and, and videos that you can find if you just look around. And so this is, you know, them uh, building a, I don't know if this is, this looks like uh, one of the main lane roads. Um, so they're, they're trying to build, trying to get the dirt work done there. This is them setting up uh, the forms there where they have a sledgehammer and probably this would be a stake to keep that form nice and reinforced. And then this is just another picture of, of uh, 1940s, early 50s of them um, doing, another, do, doing some more pavement with fixed forms. And you can see here that the fixed forms, they can ride on the top of, of the forms and they can really move that concrete and make it nice and flat, a lot better than uh, with you know having just an army of, of laborers going and flattening everything down. Right behind that paver, you have all sorts of different finishing operations that are occurring. Probably right here, you have that person putting a board down to make a saw joint right there. 
This person here, if I was guessing, would probably be bull floating, uh, you know, getting the top of that concrete nice and level and, and making sure it's nice and flat and level um, with, you know, the contour with the crown of the pavement. Here is a highway straight edge. Um, uh, that's, you know, in essence, trying to make sure that that the floor is nice and flat and level the way that you want so that you that, so when you drive down the road it's nice and smooth for you know uh, for for driving so that's kind of your goal you see there they're taking uh, texture maybe it's burlap and they're dragging it on the surface to maybe to uh, create that textured um, uh, fill on the top and then behind, they have uh, crews that's come behind and put in curing uh, burlap that's all wet. And they're putting that on top, make sure that you don't have any rapid moisture loss and, and cracking, um, plastic shrinkage cracking and drying shrinkage cracking. So um, they're trying to make sure that nice and cured. So let's talk about modern day pavements. Modern day pavements, you know, um, a lot of the finishing operations, a lot of stuff similar, but we just, we have better equipment. We have GPSs, we have micro stations that can really help out and make sure that we get the right elevations uh, on the road and we have the right crown, the right slope. So we can do our horizontal and vertical alignments and everything looks great. So surveying has been a huge um technology uh uh for us it's really helped us out you can see over there they have um, a bull float that's a little bit longer then they have a highway straight edge that's coming behind um, so they may not have super tight pavement tolerances but um uh, but they're making sure everything looks nice and everything's happy so so slip form pavers, you know, these are really large machines. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're very dependent throughout the, the entire process of, of, of placing and finishing that concrete. And really, if you have, you know, a good operator with good equipment and, you know, um, and you have, you know, basic, a decent mix design, I mean, you can pave a lot of concrete um, very nice, very smooth, and um, you don't have to have a bunch of finishers back there. You really, you know, uh, to to do a lot of your, your a lot of your work. A paver can do a lot of it, and uh, you know, you obviously you're gonna have a highway straight edge person back there to make to check, to make sure everything's nice and level and and stuff like that. But you don't have to have as many finishers. These pavers today, you don't have to have the forms on the side. Uh, you know, they, they're supposed to be stiff enough to hold an edge, but still flowable enough to be consolidated. And so you could really pave a bunch of, 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 of uh, feet of pavement in a day now. So you can really reduce the amount of labor that you need uh, for, you know, doing form work and placing all these pavements now so it, it's a huge difference so one of the important parts whenever you do pave when you do paving work is the elevation or excavating all all the all the side so cutting and filling and making sure all the dirt works um dirt works properly there removing all that vegetation because that vegetation is just going to rot out and die and create a hole if you just put dirt on top of it so you got to take it all out and you know and if you have any bad poor soil you need to take it out and put good aggregate base down and so there's a lot of dirt work that's involved whenever you're doing whether it's asphalt or concrete pavements there's a lot of dirt work that can be involved and you know it's really important to get that done that's why it takes usually quite a bit longer just to do the the dirt work than it does to actually just go out and start paving and so you know that you can really save a lot of the thickness of of your concrete if you just go out and you provide a good sub base 
So there's different designs when we deal with pavements. You have the, jo the jointed plane con uh, concrete where you just have dowel bars and tie bars. So dowel bars go in the transverse uh, you know, direction every so many feet, like you can see here. Um, and they go right on top of your saw joints. And then you have a tie bar. These tie bars tie in to uh, it in the, uh, I should say the dowel bars go longitudinally, I guess. And then on the transverse joints, but the longitudinal joints, the tie bars tie those together. Hopefully that kind of makes sense what I'm saying. In essence, your dowel bars, um, they are more in the horizontal, the transverse direction, tying whenever you saw the concrete, um, they keep that, that concrete kind of together and transfer that load. Then you have tie bars, which are uh, a lot of times more like rebar reinforcement still and they're they are deformed meaning they have ridges on the sides a lot a lot more times and they will connect that pavement in the longitudinal joint direction so dowel bars a lot of times don't have they're nice and smooth so that they can so that there is some movement back and forth um, so just kind of be aware of that so there's no rebar in this jointed plane this, these jointed planes. So these are what a dowel bar basket looks like. Normally for, you know, you're gonna have pavements. They're gonna be bigger, they're gonna be six inches or larger. Typically, if you're on a very lightweight uh, parking lot, you may be at six inches. There are some people, you know, five and four inches, but you're really asking for trouble, especially if you have if you have heavier, you know, if you have any semis that are going to drive on it at all, even if it's at, you know, five miles an hour, uh, you're really asking for cracking structural cracks and stuff because that concrete may just not be strong enough. So minimum dowel, dowel, dowel bar diameter is usually 1.25 inches. It's very common in Oklahoma. And then you have, again, the, uh, the transfer of joint loads. Uh, so you're gonna saw right on top of that concrete once it gets hard enough. This helps to reduce the amount of pumping and faulting and corner breaks um, by going and having this. Cause they used to not have dowel bars even in there and they just come back and solve a concrete. And over time they realize that that concrete uh, has drag shrinkage and, and things warp and and curl and so you'd start at, a, at every 10 foot when they saw the, the, the concrete they hear they they wouldn't be very uh smooth driving you you drive down the road you hear on every single one of those joints and it was really annoying so they came back with dowel bar retrofits where they where they went in and cut in these little bitty slots to put the dowel bars in because they had so many problems. Uh, that was really common back in the 90s. And so now you just have uh, these jointed plain concrete. That's, that's, that's the design now that works a lot better than, than not having any, uh, any uh, connections at all. So these dowel bar, this is kind of what uh, ODOT, they have their basic dowel bar basket detail right here. You can go through it. There'll be an attachment where you can go through and actually look at all the little details about, uh, about what their standards are. When we talk about tie bar, see those things on the side, they're gonna tie pavement sections together. It's very common to, if you wanna pave one uh, road lane at a time, to put in a tie bar, um, wherever you want to tie each lane together. So usually, like I said, it's common number three or number four bar. So three eighths or a half inch piece of rebar. And usually they're about one inch or they're two foot, two foot size pieces of rebar or three foot size pieces of rebar. And they're connected uh, a lot of times at every three foot or four foot sections. Sometimes we'll see them even at five foot sections uh, spaced. 
throughout here. So just kind of be aware of that. A lot of times they'll bend them back down so that if they're doing a lot of dirt work over here so that they don't get any holes in, in their uh, equipment and they can get these that dirt work done just right and it's a lot closer where they have a lot less stuff to do by hand. So whenever you're actually pouring, this is kind of what it looks like. You have your dowel bars there or horizontal for your transverse direct, for your transverse direction. And then you have your longitudinal tie bar right there. See, these are actually on baskets right here. There's some that have machines that go down and stick, stick the, uh, stick the dowel bars or the tie bars down into that concrete. So, um, this is usually more of a common design where you actually have a big nail gun that comes in and nail and uh, shoots a nail through the basket to hold that, hold the dowel bar or the tie bars together. So let's talk about another design that, 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 that we have, continuously reinforced concrete. So especially down in Texas, they love this. This is a great design down there where they will use uh, longitudinal, meaning the, the vertical direction. They will have these, these really tight spaced rebar and then uh, in, in a longitudinal on a, in a transverse or in longitudinal direction. And then the transverse direction, they have uh, maybe every four feet, six feet, even eight feet I've seen sometimes uh, for certain for, for certain applications, they will have um, this you know, transverse still running through there. So the longitudinal still is actually uh, part of the design, part of the structural reinforcement. So a lot of times they're going to be not in the middle of the pavement, but actually uh, about two inches from the top of the pavement. So in other words, if you have an eight inch pavement, you may be putting that reinforcing still at right at, um, you know, five, uh, six inches, five and three quarters. I mean, it, it, you know, they're, but they say on the blueprints, uh, on the drawings. So it's kind of important to kind of recognize you, you really don't want that reinforcement still to be in the middle of the concrete because there's actually a neutral at axes there. So that won't actually provide any structural importance, but it could help with shrinkage and temperature still. And that's actually what that transverse direction, that's what they do there, is it will actually help whenever that concrete um, loses moisture from drying shrinkage. It'll actually help hold those uh, any cracks that will help them hold together. It'll also do the same thing with the temperature. If, uh, you know, if, 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 this, if things are starting to expand because of temperature or contract because of temperature, that reinforcement can also help kind of do some of that. So I just, you know, I wanted just to kind of make sure people are aware there is reinforced concrete designs out there, but some of them are not cheap. Some can be uh, can be pretty costly. That reinforcement still, as you can see, it's it's so tight um, that you it can be a pretty penny. Um, am I saying that that this is a better design than dowel bars? Not necessarily. It, it just depends on you know what you're having problems with and how much you know. I think both have been very successful systems. So I'm not going to sit here and say one's better than the other. They're different, you know, they're design, there are some design differences. And I think you can, you know, with dowel bars, with a jointed, uh, with a uh, jointed reinforced design, you can get away and it's a cheaper design. It's a more economical design, but, um, you know, they're showing down in Texas where um, these roads may actually last a little bit longer when they're continuously reinforced. So, you know, I think some of the design will uh, is we're still learning because it takes years and years and years to really see how well the designs work. 
Um, and so we're hearing, we're hearing some people say these are really good in certain states and some states say that they, they don't work as well. So uh, that they're just a little, they're a little too, too expensive. So, so right now it, I feel like it's more of a DOT preference. So one thing I should state is a lot of times with continuously reinforced concrete, they don't even saw the top of the concrete. They just let it crack wherever it's going to crack at and they have enough steel reinforcement in that concrete where it just holds all those cracks together. So you're going to have your steel in a um, both a longitudinal and a transverse direction. And so that's going to hold all your, your concrete together. And then, you know, you will have, uh, you know, longitudinal joints. You will have them every so often. And you just, and the rebar is supposed to hold those cracks together where they're extremely finite, really small. But it is not uncommon for a section of, of, uh, of, of road lane to be either with a construction joint or with a uh, um, or sawed for for the for the longitudinal part to be sawed, but the transverse may or may not be actually sawed depending on what your what what the design is. So I've seen some that are designed that are sawed and they go back and seal put sealer in that uh, saw joint. So. This is kind of before they go and start paving it. This is your tie bar. So you can see how this is rebar that's just sticking out. And then they have rebar right on top of that um, within, that's probably about an inch and a half, two inches. They have rebar right there next to um, the, the pavement. So that's gonna be a really good to hold in all that, con or all that concrete. And then they have little chairs underneath to hold that concrete from falling. You can see a little plastic chair there so that they're actually standing um, upward and they're not going to be on the ground. So you can see how much it's a lot of, 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 of chairs, a lot of rebar all through there. Uh, you can see how this one's actually really tightly, the transverse still looks like it's on about Probably, if I was guessing, it'd be on uh, the transverse back and forth. Looks like it's on about two foot, three foot centers, something like that. And then here is, it looks like it's about every six inches. So um, there's different types of uh, elevations for these pavers. So how do you know your long your vertical and horizontal alignments? So how, how these, you know, how these roads, the elevations on them and the crowns that's on them and stuff like that, how do you figure all that out? Well, a lot of it is the surveyor and the transportation engineer will go through and actually design a lot of that. And so you'll, you'll, you'll be left with the, if you're the contractor, you'll be left with the, um, with the drawings that kind of tell you where to get that at. So you can set up your string line, or if you have a stringless paver, that's even better when you have a GPS and you can kind of set everything up. So you gotta be real careful if, you're, if, you, if you have a paver, an older paver that has a string line on it, you do not want to hit the string line. It's very critical that you don't knock it over because this actually sets a lot of the elevations for that paver as it's going. So you got a stake, and you have um, the string line on it. For stringless pavers, what you're going to do is you may have a total station or a GPS, and it's actually communicating right with that paver. You have your operator up here, and so it can it can be a uh, if you set it up right, it can be almost a robotic um, movement where where the elevations are done for you as you're paving down the road. And you don't have to continuously ingest everything. So it's pretty cool, the different points, um, making sure everything's done right. So let's talk about inside a paver now. So talking about a lot of the construction, the dirt work, some of the design aspects, 
but whenever we go and you know we see a paver what's actually part of the paver well that's a great question here's some of the components of the paver you have an auger you have a strike off plate a vibrator a tamper a profile pan and then a side form so obviously the auger that's you know that's going to be uh archimedes you can think of um, you know basic 101 um, augers and how you know augers can even pick up water back in, back on the day and they still some people still use them but those augers can really move a lot of things around so that's what they're used for here where it just kind of places the concrete um, from whenever it's dumped out in the dump truck or the conveyor belt or whatever um, it can it can it can move that concrete move that head of that concrete where it needs to be and then you have a basic strike off plate that'll kind of knock down the high spots and right behind that you have a vibrator that will consolidate the top of that concrete it may vibrate all the way down it may not so they write more on the top because the contractor gets paid for what compressor strength and smoothness so smoothness is a big deal so you're going to vibrate to make sure all the rock particles go down all the pace comes up so you can get a nice smooth level uh, finish so it's a nice smooth ride then right behind that you're going to have your tamper there that will help not uh, tamp down any of the excess maybe vibrator trail it will kind of knock some of that down then right and then, then right after that, you're going to have your pan profile that will um, really finish a lot of that top of that concrete. If you think of it as almost like a floating operation, it kind of just kind of knocks down most of the basic uh, surface ish, uh, uh, basic surface uh, blemishes and stuff. And then you have a side form right there too. And those side forms are awesome because you don't have to do any formwork. They do all the molding for you. They're right there. It's great. Um, I've done a lot of formwork in my life and, and it's really cool to have those side forms. And once it comes out of the back of that paver, it is, you know, it should hopefully be one, edges should be nice and stiff, should have a pretty good uh, surface on it and everybody's happy and that's when you can start doing your other final surface finishes if you need to so this is the head of the paver right here you can see the auger moving back and forth this is a project in dallas so this has continuously reinforced concrete in it and this is what this is kind of what the vibrators look like there's a, 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 a pan profile there so you have a vibrator these vibrators uh, the operator can can uh, increase them up or down, so you got to be really careful to not um, to not turn them up too high because you can really knock out a lot of your air and cause segregation issues. So if your mix is just not very is not consolidating very well, it doesn't mean that your equipment necessarily is wrong. It could be great equipment, but it could be you just have a bad mix. So really be aware that I see that a lot in the field where people just start cranking up their vibrations to get the concrete down. And in fact, you really, you really should have just um, get a better mix. A lot of paving, uh, paving pavers now, the recommended vibration, uh, vibrations per minute is about 8,000. A lot of people want to run between uh, 5,000 and 8,500, uh, you know, 30 years ago whenever you know, the rotors were bigger and things, things looked different, they would, uh, they would run them on a much higher rate and things, were, thing, you know, things weren't as bad. But now we're a lot more efficient, the, the, the rotors and everything. So now we've got to be real careful not to get too high and start causing segregation and, and knocking out air. So um, just kind of kind of be aware of that. So that's kind of what a, the vibrators look like. They're spaced about every 16 inches. Then you have a strike off plate to so the top. There's kind of like what you think of as a strike off plate right there. So you think of it as a strike off, a strike off board. Uh, that's in essence kind of what it is. 
then you know we have the back of the paver right there with nice smooth finished edge and so um, so kind of what that looks like you may have some type of basic um, finishing operation here I forget what that exactly is or what, what I'm looking at right here. It's kind of hard to see, um, but you might have, um, this looks like almost like a, uh, um, in essence, like a, like a long float that moves back and forth on this paver and makes sure everything's uh, nice and smooth. A lot of times you don't have that type of, that, that that almost acts like a uh, strike off uh, highway straight edge. So this is a highway straight edge here. This is going to help uh, level of these un uh, uneven spots. This is a 10 foot long. So 10 foot really helps out. You can highlight those problems. You can really see, especially three eighths of an inch or less. It can really show those holes and you can go back and you can re-level things or you can even just put the strike or put the straight edge down and and kind of just do kind of a check to make sure that there's no not going to be any uh, ride smoothness issues so real-time smoothness you can actually go through there are uh there are uh like you can see here there are different mounts you can put up in the back of the paver that will measure the real-time smoothness over time. It's really cool. So you can have your vibrator monitor speed right there that kind of controls where your vibrators are at. And then right next to it, you can actually have another box that will tell you how smooth everything is, is looking back there. And that way you can really tell how much finishing and stuff that you really need to do. This is also some write-on equipment that a lot of DOTs will, will use. We actually have some of this equipment at OSU um, where you go back and they'll just literally ride on the top of that concrete after it's, after it's nice and hard um, and, you know, it gains proper strength. And they'll just ride on the top of there and they will check the smoothness. So it's really cool some of the technology we have. This is kind of uh, from an operator's standpoint. Uh, you can kind of look at, you have a teleconveyor belt here that's placing, making the head of the concrete. You have your vibration range. You can change this. Uh, this has a monitoring system. It's pretty cool. Your goal is you don't want to go more than about three feet per minute. So you want to go under three feet per minute for sure. Um, you start, you know, you, you really, you really, uh, pavers really can't go more than about that with the vibration settings we have. So you got to be real careful. You don't want to go too fast with a paver. You want nice and steady throughout your day. Um, it's kind of your goal. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on that the operator has to control. They may have, uh, have a lot of times if you have a GPS, your paver may have elevation. So you can actually check to see where you're at and some pavers will uh, readjust for you. Uh, sometimes you, uh, the operator will actually have to adjust um, themselves. So it's really cool, some of the uh, technology that's coming out. You can check for pavement thickness in different ways. This is not exactly an easy method. You can insert a rod or you can go back when the concrete's hard and you can actually take a core but, um, you know, a lot of times people just may even just measure the sides just to see how, how thick it is. So, so let's talk about finishing. So you got the back there, you have the highway straight edge. There's a lot of different ways to finish the top of the concrete. This is some like uh, artificial type uh, turf that just roughens up the concrete. And this is for a uh, city street in Dallas. So here is a textured finish um, and a broom finish. So a lot of times when you do, when you do real light, uh, low volume traffic, 
uh, low uh, low speeds. You may have a broom finish, especially like a, a driveway or a parking lot where there's a lot of foot traffic. You want to create a good uh, surface finish that has a lot of friction. So a broom finish is great for that. However, whenever you're driving 70 miles an hour down the road and you slam on your brakes, uh, all that surface finish actually will wear off and it'll be like glass. So you really want to come in with something like tiny, where you create that 16th, that eighth of an inch insert in there so that whenever you slam on your brakes, if you're going 70 miles an hour down the road, um, it just takes off a little bit of that of that concrete off the top, but you still have all those little ridges there. So it still provides you a nice, good friction. Um, so you know, city streets and approaches. Again, a lot of a lot of city streets and approaches. You can see there, there's more formwork that's involved. There's you know, you can do curbs where where everything's. Uh, the, the, the forms are all built and they're all there. They're all dug in a certain way. So um, a lot of cities, uh, streets and approaches may not have these really cool, fancy uh, slip form pavers, but they may have screed trust or wet screed trust, uh, wet screeds that ride on the top of that concrete. Or you, I've even seen that some with two by fours, these don't normally work as well and don't ride as well. So I'd highly suggest from not using a two by four to strike off for a street, especially if you're going more than 25 miles an hour. It just, the ride is not very good. You really want to use a screed truss. It works really well. Sometimes I'll even see people use uh, laser screeds. Um, uh, so, but I really like uh, screed truss. I think they work really well, especially on metal forms. So when we talk about uh, sidewalks and driveways uh, next to these roads, you know, usually they're most of them are uh, four inches, five inches thick. You, know, you may see some driveways, especially when it's closer than maybe at five or six inches. But a lot of this concrete, whenever you're doing a city street and you have to pour the, the drive, um, you know, a lot of times they're four inches. So just kind of be aware of that. So with that, I hope you learned something. Have a great day.